Shabbat Shalom, my friends. Well, we're back together again in our safe place, a place where the spirit of inquiry is still celebrated, a place where ancient texts shed an amazing light on the truths that we are seeking. Ashrenu, happy are we, how fortunate we are to have each other and to be together. By the way, we're gonna have maybe a little bit of noise during this taping because individuals are setting off fireworks on the beach outside, illegal, unauthorized, in the middle of the night, scaring our pet, just like in New York City and other places. I apologize if you hear some pops. Speaking of truths, I've become aware recently that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in many synagogues during the uh, last few years of his life, of his ministry. For example, he spoke here in LA at Temple Israel of Hollywood. As with all of those whose mission in life involved addressing many different audiences on quite similar topics, there were certain tropes that kept popping up in King's synagogue appearances. One of my favorites is when King appealed to these Jewish communities to, quote, remain maladjusted. I love it. He didn't say neurotic. Remain maladjusted. Isn't that wondrously counterintuitive? Google describes maladjustment to refer to a situation when an individual's behavior does not meet the cultural or social expectations of society. So King pleaded with the Jewish community not to believe that in a time of crisis, it is good enough just to strive to meet what others expect of us. Not enough. Be maladjusted. Refuse to be comfortable with the way that things have always been. Refuse to see problems as being, well, simply intractable. Look for alliances where such alliances have never before really been possible. Refuse to embrace the so-called common wisdom that, well, that's just the way things are. Be maladjusted and spread maladjustment as a force for positive change. Being maladjusted might mean voting against one's privileged racial or economic status. Being maladjusted might mean acting to create more competition for our own children and grandchildren as they enter the job market. Jews should be maladjusted. It's what we are called to be. Thank you, Dr. King. That's wisdom. Okay, our sedra is Korach, Numbers chapter 16, beginning with verse 1 and following a marvelous story and the subject of countless artistic representations and of countless cautionary sermons. Don't be like Korach. Korach is a member of the tribe of Levi and thus a first cousin to Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. Korach and hundreds of his followers were Levites, but they were not of the branch of that tribe from which the Kohanim, the priests, were to be drawn. And they didn't like that at all. So they cried out, where's the logic to all of this? Why was one line of our cousins lifting up to grand power, including a branch of Levites from which the Kohanim Gadolim, the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priests, were going to be drawn. Why them? Why not us? And by the way, why is it that the select few also received a pretty, fabulous wardrobe? Those miters are really cool. Why them and not us? Korach then played what we call today the populist card. Every one of God's people is holy. Who are you to be raised up above us? The rabbinic commentators 
really didn't believe that what Korach was attempting to preach was some kind of social equality, a kind of what? Biblical democratic socialism. But he figured that populism would draw the masses to support his rebellion. I care for all of you. He could then deal with the masses later on once he had achieved the power that he was seeking. The rabbis imagined that Korach also threw back at Moses and Aaron aspects of Jewish law which seemed to the rebels to be totally absurd. And Korach, so we are told, even had a variety of Torah citations lined up that supported his claim that parts of Torah are absurd. For example, why does a building filled with Torah scrolls still require a mezuzah on its doorpost? For example, why does a garment dyed totally in blue still require four blue threads in order to serve as a talit? Really? So Korach was attacking not only what he considered to be the non-rational genealogical preferences, but the very mitzvot that were intended to help structure our moral and religious lives. To seal the case against Korach, some commentators add <clears throat> that Korach's wife pushed at him to claim more prerogatives for herself and for her family. His wife, Cherche la femme, of course. Hey, that worked in the Garden of Eden, and it seemed to have been play at play here in the desert as well. My friends, Korah wasn't totally wrong in his assertions. That's what made him so dangerous. That's why you know, the rabbis attacked Korach mercilessly. And that might be the reason why even when God, according to the Torah, caused the earth to open up and to swallow Korach and his followers alive, Korach's sons survived and were later listed as being among the forebearers of the Levitical choirs that served in the Second Temple. So Korach wasn't totally off base. If you look at many of the mitzvot, not just those two, some do indeed defy logical explanation. Korach was right about that. Take, for example, the ashes of the red heifer. You remember that. The ashes of the red heifer render impure those involved in preparing the ashes. The ashes themselves made pure those who were impure. Make sense of that. Really? Cicadas, in case you're interested, are not kosher. And in case you're interested, grasshoppers are kosher. Right? A goose is kosher, but a pelican is not. Now come on, fess up. This doesn't make any sense at all. The rabbis would scramble and say that there are some mitzvot whose sole purpose is to teach us the discipline of doing what we are required to do, regardless of what appears to us to be their absolute separation from the realm of logic. Those mitzvot mocked by Korach in the rabbinic imagination, I forgive this comparison, were considered to be like training wheels for an observant Jewish life. Korach thus becomes the default avatar for every Jew who would come to challenge a mitzvah-centered world. Korach was a rebel, but a rebel with a cause. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs agrees that not every objection raised by Korach and his followers 
was wrong or misplaced. On the contrary, Sachs, leaders, especially hereditary leaders, should and must be challenged. Sachs was chief rabbi of the UK. I wonder we thought about the queen, but fine. Rules and norms must be periodically examined closely so as to be amended, accepted, or rejected. Rules and norms. Truth claims should always stimulate within us the desire, the need, the compulsion to understand, to probe, to drill down. That's why the schools of Hillel and Shammai argued endlessly. Shammai's disciples tended to take what we would call, in our terms, a conservative, small c, position. Hillel's disciples were the equivalent of today's liberals. Their arguments were often conducted with profound wisdom, seasoned at times with some really heated emotion. But the ground swallowed up Korach and his followers and not the disciples of Hillel and Shammai. No such calamity there. Our teachers say that while Korach was arguing for flawed and unworthy purposes, his intention was very poor. Hillel and Shammai argued Lashem Shamayim for the sake of heaven. Korach argued to win. I hate people like that. The point is to win, not to be right, not to be truthful, to win. Hillel and Shammai argued for the sake of truth. Korach argued for his place in the sun. Hillel and Shammai argued to strengthen our people's ties to God and to the Torah and to the people itself. For Hillel and Shammai, there would never end up being a triumphal parade. We won argument. We won no triumphal parade, nor would there be the anguish of defeat? They heard each other. They listened to each other. They almost always disagreed with each other, but they were within the arena of Torah. We, my friends, are a proudly chronically maladjusted people. Remember again, not neurotic, maladjusted. The status quo is not our friend, no matter how much we might benefit from it, no matter how much it might privilege us. It is in our DNA to be uncomfortable with whatever today we find ourselves in. It is in our Torah to be uncomfortable with every today. Maladjusted, uncomfortable with today. And all of that can really serve to be quite a blessing for our world. That's it. Shabbat Shalom. We will gather together in maladjusted security and meet again next week. Promise. Shabbat Shalom.